I, I had a lot of questions. Like, is Curtis Grant the guy that's going to be coming in and out of the game? Like, I, I had lots of questions just because there was a question mark from that unit because of just the defense in a whole the year before. And Urban Meyer, like, like from the outside, like, he's a freak show. Like, we know he was gonna, he's going to make sure that every unit has edge. And, and preaching competition, I felt like yep. really came with that unit. And that's exactly what it was because I had played, but I really didn't play that much. So, you know, they could have taken my spot at any point. Curtis is literally like, dude, I got one year. I did not transfer. I could have, like, I got to get this done. And then uh, Darren and Chris are, are going back and forth, but Darren's really like, yo, like, you know, I, I came in here. He was doubted the same way I was. He's from New Albany. He's a suburban kid. Yeah, three you know, he played quarterback. quarterback. Yeah. yeah you know, the whole deal. And so, we we all grinded together that year like that was our year where we said we're going to make something of ourselves so we took everything personally and we all wanted to be leaders on that defense and on the team and so i think that's where the linebacker culture shift like that was a big shift that year and i give a lot of credit to curtis grant even to this day for that but 15 comes around and it's like okay I'm Wait, back. You're gonna you're gonna skip over the natty. You're gonna skip over the natty run all of a we sudden. Can, we can have a, a a separate conversation about all, all right. that. We're on your journey. Yeah, you're right. you're right. But 15 comes around. It's me. Raekwon's back. Darren's back. We're like, we got a ball. There's no excuses. We're not taking anything this off season. Nobody's taking a day off. We're not laughing. We're not ha ha he he. None of that stuff. We need to be the best unit out there because we also got Joey Bosa out there. And we also got Adolphus Washington out there. Gary on Conley's locking down one corner. Eli Apple's locking down the other. And we got Tyvis Powell and Von Bell in the back end. Sam Hubbard's going to be a nice little player for us this year. Tyquan Lewis is as well. Like we got dudes. We got guys. The like we need defense, to be good. The 15 defense was generational, bro. Bro, like, we had guys like, everywhere. Y'all have players, bro. Everywhere. And so I think it was a, a And that was Von Bell in the back end, right? Yeah, Von Bell and Tyvis Powell back there locking it down. And that was my thing. It's like, you know, 13 real wishy-washy, 14 I really built into it, but 15 I knew I was the guy on the defense along with some other guys that we had and we had to I I felt like there was an impetus on me to become a guy who could be a vocal leader, whether I was going to be the best player out there or well, not, Kurt, which Kurt I wasn't. Was gone, like, the void of Curtis. Like, Curtis Grant was exactly. such a vocal leader. Like, there's that video. Exactly. In there, I think maybe halftime in the Minnesota game, one of the games bro, where it was going close to crazy. The going crazy, bro. Like, like, I, like, let me tell you, Josh, I never played football. I never I never laced it up. I never put a helmet on. I was over here, like, ready. Like, where, Mom, where's my helmet at? Like, like I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Like, let's go hit it. And that's um, how he was. And somebody needed to be that. And so – I wanted to, and I couldn't. I couldn't be Curtis. I had to be myself, but somebody yeah. needed to be that guy, right? So that 2015 defense is that. Where would you rank that? Like all time defenses across college football. You feel like you guys are top three. I got, like as, as an Ohio State fan, like I think that 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 is the best defense to, since maybe 2010. If you look at like personnel wise. Bro, we had guys everywhere, littered across the roster. Like, like would you take that defense over last year's Georgia defense? Mm, I, we didn't we didn't have a Carter, but our secondary they didn't was, have a Bosa. No, and in our secondary was certainly better than what theirs had to offer. I think we were better at linebacker. I think their linebackers were good, not great. The Georgia defense, maybe, maybe, but um, hey, hey, now I'm just I'm just saying I'm just saying like if like I've I've compared the rosters de like like player. Dog, I don't think we gave up forty points to anybody. So. Hey. I don't think oh. so either. I I mean, the one, the one game y'all watched, I'll give up 17 points. Let me get on my CFB stats real quick to look up the uh, some of these totals here. Now you got me over here doing research. Like I'm. Hey, now, like I mean, I'm, you guys didn't have you know, Carter, but did you guys have who? Who's in the middle? Was it Draymond Jones or Adolphus Washington? We had Adolphus Washington in there. Adolphus that was, boy a was nice. He was nasty. I'm just saying. I don't want to. I don't want to make the Georgia fans mad. But I, the, I, I know the Georgia fans are gonna gonna hate me, and it's no no shade to Georgia because they were phenomenal. Oh, amazing! Certainly this year. Y'all uh, give up 30, forty burgers. We didn't give up a thirty either. Georgia gave up a thirty to LSU. But but it's it's a different game too. Yeah, and yeah, it's we didn't super, we super we, we also didn't face that Ohio State offense that Georgia faced in the Peach hey, Bowl. Man, so uh, I give F, F all that, that, bro. Uh, that was the best defense ever. Woo woo. Josh said it. What are you talking nah, about? Bro? See, nah, nah. Don't look at you. That's look the, at you do. Look best. at you doing your thing. No, that's the best defense of 2010. You can say that. 
Like they can be mad. They can argue in a mirror. Like any like listen, Josh. Anybody we nice. who's mad at anybody who's mad at you for saying that knows who you are and doesn't and you don't know who they are. It's like <laughs> that was the best defense since 2010. They can go fight with a mirror. They don't argue with somebody else. <laughs> Not fight with a the mirror. They're gonna yeah, they, they, they go yell at themselves. <laughs> I mean, that, that that defense was unreal. And I, I, I a separate question kind of about the practices in 2015. Were you guys so did you guys do ones on ones very often, like for scrimmages? In like training camp all the time. Were you guys you guys shutting that you guys shutting that offense down? <sighs> yes. Um the the one guy who I think played practice as hard as he played was Ezekiel Elliott at all times. Mm -hmm. And Mike Thomas was a constant problem for us. Taylor Decker was a phenomenal player there on uh, the outside playing tackle. And um, I think JT and Cardale challenged us in very unique ways, just having both of those guys in there. But like, I think that certainly the defense would – we put the offense in situations where they had to fight. It's not to say that they never got the best of us because it would be some days where I'd walk off the field, bro, and be like, dog, we can't play football. Like, if we play like this, we're going to lose games. Um, and I think that was always the thing about being at Ohio State is you knew that you were going to get your edge sharpened. Like, I practice in – I, think I would say that team talked about like practices were harder than games in, in probably 10 out of the, the 12 weeks that you're prepping for a game practice was harder than the game. What was, what was the best battle you saw on a daily basis? Was it like Taylor Decker versus Bosa? Probably. I think any of our, like Darren Lee and Zeke going at it in, in one-on-one -on -one anything was always good because Zeke was a, a good route runner out of the backfield. Um, he was also a great pass protector. Darren Lee could really rush. And so I thought that they always gave each other really good work. Um, guy who we don't talk about a ton, but Nick Vanette at the tight end position, he gave us a lot of issues. He wasn't necessarily a great blocker, but the guy was slippery running routes. And so, like, you know, if we're, we're prepping for a team that's tight end heavy, I'm just thinking back to training camp and the reps I got against a guy like Nick Vanette. And I'm like, Nick I'm glad I got those reps. Open. Like, he always felt Bro. open. And I don't think he gets enough credit either when we start looking at some of the great players like, Nick's still playing in the league right now. Is he with the Seahawks like, right now? No, I think he's with the – he finished the season with the Giants. Like, dude's oh, okay. still playing in the oh, league. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's a, a Columbus suburb kid too. He went to Westerville Central. I played against him in high school. Uh, played against him in basketball and everything. And he was always a great athlete. I remember we had battles in high school actually because my team, when we played Westerville Central, we would go straight man and they would have me cover Nick. And so we had battles even back then. Nick was – he was one of the guys who I feel like will never get the credit he really deserved. And, you know, the offense was never geared toward tight ends anyway. But well, he, Jeff was a, he was a was great like, player. Jeff Hyreman was like the sexier tight end in that era. Dog, Jeff was – Jeff was nice. And yeah. Jeff, when he really got in his mind that he was going to yoke somebody up on the line of scrimmage, he would put somebody – clamp them down. And I'd be like, damn, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff was everybody's favorite. Is it true that Eli Apple got beat every single time he lined up against Michael Thomas? Every single time is an exaggeration. That's an exaggeration. There, there was some back and forth on it. There's a reason Eli is a first round pick. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that Eli got dogged every day. But what I will sit here and say is that Mike Thomas was that dude. The route running was ridiculous. And Mike had this mentality that win, lose, or draw, he was going to let you hear something after mm -hmm. the play. Every play after the play, you were going to hear something from him. The guy we haven't talked about yet, though, the best athlete that I've ever seen on a football field, the most electric player that I believe has ever played college football, Braxton Miller. Braxton, that's way that's your that most electric ever. Like better athlete than Curtis Samuel? Better. Whoa. Better. Dude. Put on his quarterback highlights. Oh, I love his, that that move against Cal. Like, like, if we're, like, like, I'm about to fold the notes up. I'm not even worried about the notes. Like, if we're just talking ball, like <laughs> he said, I'm folding them up. Like, fold the notes up. Like, here we go, Josh. So I played, I played rugby back in the day, and like, like I would take stuff that I watched Braxton do, and I would use it in rugby because rugby you're playing a bunch of stiff white kids. It's so like nobody was really moving like that. So like that little high step, I feel like I changed Northeast Ohio rugby forever. That movie did against, I think it was Cal. 
Like, I I love Braxton. I think he is so electric. Uh, I also just, like, think Curtis Samuel had, like, this, like, smooth, slippery ability and was also twitched up. But, no, Bra- Braxton's – I mean, that's one of my favorite players ever to watch. That's kind of what got me into, like, this level of Ohio State football. So, Curtis Samuel having a, a running back background, he knew how to convert his speed to power. Mm-hmm. There was a, um, a moment in – spring practice where he ran over Raekwon McMillan. It was crazy. It was wild. Does Raekwon like, have like 50 pounds on him? Bro, trucking. It was nuts. And so like that was what Curtis could do. But if I, I needed a guy who was in a bind, like three dudes converging on him and would not get touched at all, give Braxton the pill. You're like there was that. You just described the Penn State play. That was the Penn State play. Like that is a, it was one of the most ridiculous plays that I have ever seen. I don't know if he should have pulled that ball in that situation. I don't even know if that was the right read because of the way the defense was set up. But he gave that hesitation step, step back, and then dove into the end zone. Show me another guy who did that. No, I'm, I haven't. I haven't seen it. And like even like like the ability to like jump cut off a spin like two yards was was really wild um like he was making guys miss as they're making a the tackle on him which was was really alarming like like braxton did, did some like braxton was like like a bat like like alan iverson type basketball yep. move on a football yep. field it was it was really it was really unreal to watch and, and i'm glad i'm glad you brought him up i do love braxton but i want to rewind josh you guys get into the playoff in 2014 yes you feeling like you could win it after that wisconsin game so what was interesting I remember uh, watching the release show because Urban didn't call a watch party and he, you know, he didn't want cameras and the whole deal if we didn't get in. And so I'm at um, Joe Berger and Craig Fader were two walk on linebackers. There's two of my best friends in college and I'm at their apartment with Cam Williams, who was my roommate. And we're watching the release show. We see our, our symbol pop up. We're going absolutely crazy. Like we are going nuts. And then Urban calls a meeting, brings us in. And he starts talking about the chase for a championship and what it means. And when I tell you that those practices were like so intense, just getting ready and and, and like preparing for the moment, it was wild. But Urban had this thing where he would build up a team to make it feel like nobody could beat him. So he's telling us about the Alabama dynasty and he's talking about all the players and they got Amari Cooper and they got these guys on defense. He's like, yeah, I don't know if you guys are ready for this. And it's a different thing that we've ever seen. And like, he's kind of making us think like, damn, like should we have even been in this thing? But as it gets... Did it feel like the national championship? I'm going to get to that. So as we get closer to the game, Urban flips the script and he's like, look at who you beat. And then look at who some of these teams from the SEC beat. They're trying to say these are the kings of college football. I don't believe that. Y'all shouldn't believe it either. Like we were prepared for this moment. We practice harder than anybody. We prepare harder than anybody. We got better athletes. I don't care who's rolling out at quarterback. It doesn't matter. All this stuff like getting us hyped. And so we go out on that field and and Coach Mick used to do this thing in Urban um, when they were talking about lining up for games. They're like, you know, when you go out in the field, you're going to look across the field and their biceps aren't going to be as big. Their arms aren't going to be as veiny and their necks aren't going to be as swollen. They don't have as big of traps as you guys. We walk out on that field. I'm like, shit, Alabama got all the traps. They got the, the calves. They got the veins, big biceps, triceps. They got all the muscles. And I'm like, this is going to be a real battle. Like we knew we were in for a real one. But when we won that game, we were like, dude, it's over. And this is no shade to Oregon because they had a a really good football team. They had the Heisman trophy winner that year. Like we knew it was going to be a challenge and that tempo offense was definitely something to deal with. We were like our, our mantra going into that game was defeat 16. It was 16 uh, seconds between snaps. We knew if we could do that, we could win, but we just had this feeling like, bro, they could have put anybody out on that field and we were going to rise to the occasion. It felt at that point after we beat Alabama, it felt, Like it was destiny for us to become national champs that year because of all the stuff that we had to fight through to get there. Um, So it it was definitely a roller coaster emotionally and just from a thought process standpoint of prepping for the semifinal and then what what prep felt like for the final. When you saw that Oregon blew out Florida State that year, did that catch your attention at all? Did you feel Mm -hmm. like, oh, like. Like maybe maybe they're a little better, or I'm, for me at least, the way I I kind of take it is like the brand of football was not conducive to winning, like to beating you guys. Yeah, it just 
I mean, I, I, I don't know how much I, I ever read into, you know, they beat this team by this much type I mean, of stuff. They, because they boat race Florida State. Like, they beat the brakes off them. And then there's that famous clip of, like, Urban at the press conference saying, they beat them by how much? Oh, we got to go prepare. And they're running off the running off the camera. Yeah, he's, he's, he, he's trying to get out the presser. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that we, we were all on alert that this was a, a phenomenal football team. I don't think it was an accident that they got to where they were and, and, and the way that they looked getting there. Um, certainly didn't feel like an accident to us. But at the same time, I also – you know, we we blew out Wisconsin, you know, fifty nine to zero. Who did that all year? Yeah, I mean that was that was a Heisman. You, you know, it was the Heisman gauntlet, right? Because yeah, and we had three Heisman. guys that were up there on that stage. Melvin Gordon, friend of mine, I played with him in San Diego. Um, he's come on my show on Bally Sports the Rally. Um, phenomenal player. We limited to like eighty yards. And then uh, who was it for Bama? Mari oh, Cooper. Mark. Mm-hmm. There's no shade to Amari for not remembering that because they had a bunch of dudes out there. I know Derrick Henry. Yeah, the good team. I mean, I thought the scariest <laughs> player on that team for me was was Derrick. I guess in Ohio State. Derrick, Derrick Henry. Henry. Der- yes, and 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 he is as big as me, toting the rock. Mm-hmm. Like that was where I was like, shoot, man, this dude is. He is a massive human being. I thought the Bama coaches did themselves a little bit of a disservice by falling in love with T.J. Yeldon the way they did. Like I thought like, Yeldon was a really good player. I thought Yeldon was a really good player, but there was kind of almost a focus to make him the workhorse back rather than than letting Derek go crazy. Yeldon definitely in hindsight feels like he was more of a change up, mm-hmm. especially what they were doing he offensively at the time. Yeah, yeah. He got, yeah. Like I like TJ Yeldon a lot. Like I was a TJ Yeldon fan, but when he was in the backfield first when I saw Derrick Henry out there, I was like, damn, like like Derek's like stiff arm and DBs, like right nah, now. No, he was nice. <laughs> he was really nice. And like I've I've talked to Tyvis Powell on the Twitter space, and he was like, "Yeah, like I was just real thankful that I didn't, ta- I didn't tackle Derrick Henry." No, like, he, that was that man was a load. Mm-hmm. He, I mean, bringing him down was was no easy task. I mean, he was built like a defensive end. So you're on stage, you guys win the Natty. You're looking out in the crowd. Urban Meyer says, "Yeah, we weren't supposed to do it this year. These guys were a year ahead of schedule." Are you in your head thinking, "Oh, we're about to go back to back"? Bro, so let me let me walk you through that. So like all, everybody's celebrating up on stage. I go and find my parents. I'm like, I need to I need to, you know, show love to my people. So I didn't even make it up yeah, on the this, main this stage. System, like like you yeah. weren't sure two years going to finish your career at Ohio State. Like you were told by that guy holding up the trophy saying we're a year ahead of schedule that you weren't like that. And that right. support just kept you there. So, yeah, absolutely. But I missed my opportunity to get on the main stage, which was a tactical error in hindsight because I don't have any of those photos that everybody else has. So young kids out there, if you ever think you're going to win a championship, you you can always talk to your family a little bit later. Um, but it, it I feel like almost instantaneously, um, a lot of us started thinking about what this means in the big picture. And then that conversation kind of went away. And then once we really got back to working out, I think a lot of us looked around the locker room and saw many familiar faces and said, this is an opportunity for us to run it back. And I will go to my grave saying that the 15 team would beat the 14 team. Just, I mean, that's it. They they would beat them. Um, I thought the 15 team was was too good to fail. And I think a lot of us felt that way. And this is one of the things that- We're almost better everywhere in in, in 15. So this is one of the things that I take personally, because I was a captain on that 15 team. And in the off season, we got guys going to All Star Weekend, and, and we're making appearances at the ESPYS. Every one of our players is on the national award watch list, and they're semifinalists and finalists by the end of the year. And I just feel like, from a leadership standpoint, I should have done a better job of making guys realize like we got to keep first things first. Like we can't keep start amazing. thinking about the destination. We got to be committed to this journey. Um, and it all came to a head in that Michigan State game where we got upset by a team that should not have beaten us. And I'm not saying they're a bad football team um, by any stretch because they were a good ball team, but I don't think that that was a team that we would typically lose to. Um, and especially the way that it happened, it was the last time I ever played in the horseshoe. We lost on a last second field goal. Like there's so many emotions and so much regret about that game specifically. And then to follow it up with the two game stretch we had after that, we went to Ann Arbor, top 10 matchup against Michigan. Harbaugh's first year, we beat them 42 to 13. And then we play Notre Dame in a Fiesta Bowl. This is before people were really opting out like that. Jalen uh, Jalen Smith got hurt in that game with the knee injury. 
but like everybody was playing and we handled Notre Dame. Like we had all of the talent to go back to the playoffs and to make a legit run at a second national championship in a row. And we did not focus on the journey. And it's so regrettable. And like, if I, if I talk to young people to this day, it's one of the things that sounds so cliche and it's like, Oh, who's this old guy trying to tell me how to live my life. But it's so important. Like there are so many times where I feel like we, we wish moments away. I, I said this actually on my show today. We think about the things that we have to do instead of the things that we get to do. And so we don't really take the time to appreciate the good and the bad of just the mundane everyday things. We didn't, we didn't commit ourselves to the mundane everyday things. We committed to the big picture, no doubt. But within that big picture, there are some smaller things that need to be achieved. We didn't check every single box, and that's how you lose a game like that. Menace Army, thank you for uh, for watching that video. Josh Perry's great. We got more parts of it, obviously. So make sure you like and subscribe on the YouTube side. We're up over eighteen thousand subscribers. Trying to get to that good old twenty k mark. The sooner, the better. And obviously, we're gonna keep pumping out content to you. I'm Chris Drew. Thank you again for liking and subscribing to the channel. Remember, always share with a friend. Menace out.